We started our series on Easter, the characters of Easter, on February the 28th. I preached on the sovereignty of God, that the Easter story was not some knee-jerk reaction by a heavenly father that did not know what was going on. No, we trust his sovereignty that through the hand and plan of God, everything happened exactly as it was supposed to happen. The next week, I talked about the failures of the Apostle Peter. Then Pastor Keenan preached on the Apostle John. And then last week, we landed the plane on Doubting Thomas, on how sometimes in our doubt, it allows us to really discover the truths that could set us free. Today, however, we're going to talk about the religious. And I begin on the front side of the sermon by simply reminding you that religion will send you to hell. You can be the most religious person in North Alabama. You can be the most religious person in the city of Athens and still die and go to hell. But if you and I have a relationship with Jesus, it makes the religion that we carry with us a very beautiful, beautiful thing. But let's think back to 2,000 years ago during the times of Jesus. We know that there were a lot of religious and political groups that wanted power. They wanted prestige. They wanted to be seen. And there is an incredible listing, if you will, of these religious and political groups that, again, many of us are familiar because we've been in Sunday school in the past. You've heard sermons about them. But let me give you just a few to help jog our memory. The Galileans were this right-wing group that were present during the first century. Uh, Then we had the Hellenists, who were Greek-speaking Jews. Uh, We had the Levites, and you know the Levites. They had responsibility over the temple. And then there were folks like us, Gentile converts to Judaism that they called the proselytes. Then, of course, the Samaritans, that Jewish-Gentile mixed race. And then there was a group called the Zealots, fanatical Jewish patriots. And then there were, of course, the scribes, students, interpreters, and teachers of the Old Testament law. And then you've heard me say the word Sadducees before. They were the theologically liberal in the first century. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the immortality of the soul. And on the other side of what I would call the same coin, you have the separatist Pharisees. They were the conservatives, sort of like I am. And I know that in the course of my 32 years plus in the ministry, I've probably been a Pharisee on more than one occasion. And in contrast with their liberal Sadducees, eventually these two religious groups set aside their theological differences and they joined forces. And they joined forces and they became bitter enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, Pastor... If they were supposed to be religious, if they were supposed to believe in God, why didn't they follow Jesus? The same way that many of us don't. Many of us today who say that we love God, we don't live like we love God. And the Word of God simply calls us Pharisees. So I began to study last week and I came across that very familiar character of John the Baptist. He was actually the first prophet that called out religious Pharisees. Now, I'm not into name-calling as such. Now, I know that on occasion I let my tongue get in front of my brain, and I will do that. But Jesus called them, and John the Baptist called the Pharisees a brood of vipers. Now, we don't hear that word brood a lot today in the 21st century. So, literally, it's a family of snakes. So, John and Jesus called first century religious leaders deadly sons of serpents. Deadly sons of serpents. Now, I've been called some names over the course of the last three decades, but I've never been called a brood of vipers. But what I do know is that Jesus and John both had a mission. They wanted to call out the Phariseeism. They wanted to call out the hypocrisy of religion in the first century. So these future characters of Easter would live up to that brood of vipers metaphor both before, during, and after the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. So over these next 20 minutes or so, 
I want us to not only see, but also understand that the Pharisees seem to be always showing up and are always on the wrong side of Jesus. I had a conversation in the last six months where someone who was a theological liberal told me that I'm on the wrong side of history. And I told them I'm fine with being on the wrong side of history as long as I'm on the right side of Jesus. And I believe that those of us who are students of the Word of God, who live out the Word of God, will see that happen more and more as the days go by. Many of us here in the South are familiar with the banjo player and the fiddle player, Charlie Daniels, who recently went home to be with the Lord. But in 1996, he, he developed a Christian album, and one of the songs on that album was called The New Pharisees, he called the new Pharisees self-appointed sin patrol. I want you to look in your heart today and find out if that's you. You do a very good job of pointing out everybody else's mess-ups and fumbles and flops and failures and sin, but you never see your own. That's what Charlie Daniels talked about in 1996 on his album. That's what John and Jesus talked about in the first century. Don't be a self-appointed sin patrol. So the religious Pharisees hated and rejected Jesus because he knew who they really were. He actually looked at their life and because he was the son of the living God, he not only saw their false outward actions, he also knew the intent of their heart. So he calls them out. So let me take our remaining time together and Let's take a couple of passages of Scripture and see what Jesus has to say about it. If you have your Bibles, your smartphone, your iPad, your Kindle, turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, and then in just a moment, we will segue over to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 15, beginning in verse 1. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? When Brother Andy and Brother Mark and the rest of our uh, pastor search team extended a call to me uh, several years ago now, we, we talked about the traditions of First Baptist Church Athens, and many of them are wonderful. Many of them are very good, and they are rooted and grounded in Scripture. But First Baptist, like so many other Baptist churches, Methodist churches, and others, have a lot of traditions that have nothing to do with the Bible. It's simply now part of our DNA, and it's just what we do. We see in Scripture, in the response to the question, for they do not wash their hands when they eat. Now, if you're a student of the Old Testament, especially the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the book of Leviticus gives a lot of rules and regulations for hygiene. One of those include about washing your hands, ritualistic washing. So now... The Pharisees are taking it to the next level, creating a law out of it, and notice the response of Jesus. He answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Jesus is about to go beyond what you do in your physical body, and he's going to start speaking to their heart. He said, you may wash your hands before every meal, but your heart is dirty before the Lord, which is really what matters. Jesus goes on to say in verse 6, So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the Word of God. It means you pay more attention to all these rules and regulations, the Mishnah, the things that have been added onto the law rather than the law itself. And based on that, what does Jesus call them? He says, you hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips but their heart is far from me. I know a lot of people that honor God with their lips, but their life is contrary to what they say. It doesn't match up. Their, their walk does not match their talk. And that was one of the problems that John the Baptist and Jesus saw in the life of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and so many others. Jesus goes on to say about the Pharisees, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So again, there are good traditions that local churches may have. But when you begin to tie your salvation 
into the traditions instead of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's when you start getting into trouble. When you start saying, well, you got to be like me. No, we got to be like Jesus. Let's be like our Lord. That's what's going to get us into heaven. Not looking like the preacher or looking like the deacon or looking like the Sunday school teacher. No, we need to look like Jesus. That's what's our only hope. That is what is our salvation. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's a question for us today. See, because most of us know the Christian lingo. We've been in church long enough to know what to say to get people off our back. But here's the question for us this morning. Is your heart far from God? And I want to tell you, this pandemic, being out of church, more than being in church, not being around one another as iron sharpens iron and just me looking into a camera lens and, and being online only, I mean, that can have an effect on you, a long-term effect on you. Today, friend, ask yourself, is my heart far from God? And if it is, you're in the right place. This is a, this is a safe place to hear something dangerous that could change everything about you if we would simply allow it to do so. Now let's transition now from Matthew 15. Let's go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples that the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, meaning they're in leadership. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. This is when a parent tells their child, do as I say, don't do as I do. For they preach, but do not practice. Zeke is reaching that age now that when he was much younger, I would tell him to do something. I'd say, Zeke, I don't care. I want you to do it because I've told you to do it. No questions asked. Now he's at that age, he'll go, well, why, Daddy? And I'll say, Zeke, it's okay for you now to ask Dad why, but I simply also want you to be obedient. He says, Daddy, I have no problem with that. I just want to know why I'm doing what you have asked me to do. We see in God's Word that the Pharisees were willing to preach, but they were unwilling to practice what they were preaching. Friend, the Bible calls that hypocrisy. The Bible calls that Phariseeism. Let us not be guilty in the 21st century what that religious crowd was guilty of in the 1st century. Jesus goes on to say some other things that the Pharisees were doing. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear. They lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. You know what Jesus is saying? You're trying to get other people to do things that you won't do yourself. The Bible says, be holy as I am holy. Well, God said that. The Word of God teaches us that. Well, see, God can say, be holy as I am holy, because God is holy. But the problem is when you and I start saying it, and we're not holy. When we start telling our kids, when we start telling our Sunday school class, when we start preaching from the pulpit, and we're encouraging the congregation to do something that we are unwilling to do ourselves, we are hypocrites when we do that. And then we have showcase Christianity. Verse 5, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. Listen, if you're going to do something good for somebody, don't take a picture of it and put it on social media. You've, you've stolen your reward. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Don't be like the Pharisee and do your deeds to be seen by others. And then it even talks about what they wear. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Hey, man, don't my robe look good today? Don't I look good today? Listen, Jesus calls that out. He goes on to say, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues. It means they got the best seats in the house. They get the box seats at the ball game. Greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. Oh, I wish I had time to parse all this out, but I think you get the point. That today, in 21st century Christianity, based upon 1st century Christianity, which was founded by the Lord Jesus Christ, let's not blow our own horn. Let, let us not draw attention to ourselves when we are serving others, when we are caring for others. Let us make sure that what we do, we do for God. Because if we're doing it to be seen by men, you already have your reward. But if we do what we do and do not want to be seen except by God, great is our reward. Now, beginning in verse 13 of that same chapter in Matthew 23, 
We're going to see these words repeated no less than seven times. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Hypocrites. So I was studying for the sermon this past Tuesday afternoon, and I got a chance to study again on Thursday. And one of those woe to you really stuck out in my mind, and that's the one I want to sort of capitalize on now. Look at Matthew 23, verses 27 and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now again, the difference between us and the Lord Jesus is that he knew their thoughts. We don't know each other's thoughts. We can be easily fooled. We can have someone that sort of dresses up on, nice on the outside. They're like a whitewashed tomb. They appear outwardly beautiful. But on the inside, there's corruption. On the inside, there is unconfessed and unrepented of sin. And that person stays that way long enough. Their whole life will become so shallow that they only live to outwardly appear righteous to others. They never want to get right with God. Why? Because they believe they have everybody fooled. But not a one of us can fool God. Somebody say amen. amen. None of us can fool God. Now you can fool me. I'm pretty gullible. I try to believe the best in people. Maybe you can be easily fooled as well. But our Heavenly Father cannot. He knows who we really are. And that's the message that John the Baptist and Jesus was trying to get over to the Pharisees. Listen. Eventually, there were some Pharisees in Scripture that got saved, Nicodemus being one of them, John chapter 3. Then the apostle Paul, who was Saul the persecutor, who became Paul the preacher in Acts chapter 9. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, tribe of Benjamin. He sat at the feet, under, under the feet of Gamaliel, the great law teacher. And yet, we see in God's Word, yeah, Pharisees can be saved, but not a lot of them do. Because they believe their salvation is based upon their outward appearance, religion, rather than on the inside, which is relationship. Now again, this is just a sampling of the scriptures that are used in God's word to call out Phariseeism and call out the Sadducees and the other religious groups. But now I want to pull out a response of the lawyers, which were also in the part of the scribes and the Pharisees in Luke chapter 11. So one of the lawyers answered Jesus and said, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. They felt insulted. Why? Because they were religious. And most religious people are easily insulted. But those people who have a heart for Jesus and really want to live for Jesus, when somebody rebukes them, when somebody comes in a very loving, compassionate way like John the Baptist and Jesus did and call out their sin... They are usually responding with repentance. But for those who are eaten up with religion, they don't like to have their hand called at anything. They feel like they're above somebody calling out their particular sin, so they are insulted. That's exactly what these lawyers did in Luke chapter 11. Look at verse 53. And he went away from there. The scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. So I believe from this point forward in Luke chapter 11, nothing that Jesus would do from this moment forward was ever right again. And the Pharisees began to cross their T's and dot their I's and call Jesus out. He was now the marked Messiah. Some of us in this room, we have family members that maybe come from a different tradition that call us out because they don't like our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. They, they, they want to make sure that every jot and tittle are taken care of, even to the point of what we wear, not just what we say and what's in our heart, but the outward appearances, and they pay more attention to those things than they do the, condi do the condition of the human heart. Because all of our hearts are desperately wicked. All of our hearts deserve hell, but because of the blood of Jesus being shed on Calvary's tree, you and I can be set free. Amen, church? We can be set free. We can have liberty found in Christ alone. 
But some of us have been deceived into a works-based salvation that says, if I can just do enough good things, and one day when I finally die and my good outweighs my bad, then I might make it to heaven. No, friend, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that if thou shalt confess to thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, even a Pharisee, even a Sadducee, shall be saved. And that may be somebody here today. It may be somebody that's watching online. I want to tell you that redemption is found in Christ alone, not by our good works. We, we participate in good works because we are saved, not to get saved. Christ alone. Would you allow that thought, that, that sound doctrine, that orthodox theology just to penetrate your heart this morning? Because if you will, it could set you free. So let me close with this. The Pharisees now condemn Jesus for everything. Hailing on the Sabbath, associating with sinners. They accused him of casting out demons through Satan's power. They accused Jesus of lying. They threatened retaliation on everybody who would follow him. But then it came time for the crucifixion, which is coming Good Friday, and then Resurrection Sunday, Easter next week. The Pharisees plotted the death of Jesus. The Pharisees ordered the arrest of Jesus. The Pharisees falsely tried Jesus. But listen to this. If you were here February the 28th, the Pharisees, under the plan and hand of God, called for the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, I wish I had time to expound on this, but I want you to hear me. We come to a place in our own lives, and we hear doctrinally sound Sunday school lessons. We sing doctrinally sound songs. We hear doctrinally sound sermons, and yet we don't ever learn anything. We are ever learning but unable to come to the knowledge of the truth. And here's the truth today, friend. Jesus died on the cross for us. And if we will come to him in childlike faith and repent of our sins and believe in the gospel, which is the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, the Bible says we shall be saved. And I would encourage you today, if you've never done that, let today be the day of your salvation. So let me close with this final question. What do we do when Jesus calls out our hypocrisy? What's our response? When, when someone has our number, when, when someone rings our bell, when someone steps into our life in love and says, this is wrong, this is sin, What's your response? What's my response? I don't think any of us like that, but we should be grateful and thankful that we are loved enough that God would send someone into our life and call us out for our sin. Remember, God said, be holy as I am holy.